Hey, good evening, and welcome to the pandemic version of Montpelier Civic Forum, which means, of course, that we can all vote absentee, except for those of us who want to go and vote traditionally on town meeting day, which is Tuesday, March 2nd this year. And we have an excellent election. We've got great candidates. We've got great city council candidates. Uh, and we have good school board candidates. We also have one person running for a five-year term on the Parks Commission. Uh, we also do our regular shows, which include Ann Watson talking from the mayor's seat on what it's like in Montpelier, going from one side of town to the other at projects which are ongoing, projects which have been pushed off, and projects which might never be. And we do our budget shows. Uh, we're doing one with Jim Murphy from the school board. That's a good show. And we have Bill Fraser, our city manager, along with Ann Watson, our mayor, talking about the city budget. That is tonight's show. And I want to thank Ann and I want to thank Bill for coming. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. We do this every year, pandemic or not. And the reason that we have Ann on is because budgets are built not out of nothing, they're built on policies. And Bill helps to construct off the policies that Consul and Ann set. Now this is not a zero-based budget, is it, Bill? No, we set targets and, and you know, maybe Ann can explain how the Council reaches their uh, policy direction, but we set a target of how much uh, sort of the, uh, how much we think the community can afford and what the key priorities are and then try to build a budget from that. But obviously, maintaining our services is typically one of the areas that the council gives us guidance on, and so the costs of doing that are, are somewhat fixed. So last year's budget really is the starting point of this process, and then what we do is we adjust to current priorities, current realities, and current basically desires. So the budget starts, in a sense, right after the last town meeting day when council goes on its retreat and sets its objectives. Is, would you say that's when the budget kind of starts? Yeah, you know, it's kind of a funny process because the council that's voted in on town meeting day then goes to create their budget in sort of late March, early April, and that helps set some of the direction of the, the work of the council and some of the staff for a good part of the, the rest of the year. Uh, and it's still the old budget through the Until July, July of the uh, you know of that uh, that year, uh, so whatever direction we set in in April ends up uh, kind of affecting uh, a little bit of of that year's fiscal budget, but it also helps inform the budget that we decide on that October, November, and December. Now, Bill. There are some people watching who don't know who you are. You're a city manager. How long have you been city manager? I'm just finishing my 26th year. And how long have you been on council? Uh, I was originally appointed as a city councilor for District 2 in uh, 2012, which means that it'll be 10 years next year. So we're not dealing with newbies here. Bill, how have city council's priorities changed over the years? Because I'm going to ask the same of Ann. Uh, you've watched and helped that process over many, many councils. How, have that, how has that changed? I would say not drastically. It's usually incrementally uh, as, as community priorities you know, uh, change over time. I think a constant, you know, we, we all know that Montpelier has a high tax rate, so a constant has been to be careful with that, not to, to inflate the budget too much because of the tax burden that people have. I think infrastructure has been an issue, although that became more of a priority in, say, the last eight to ten years. Uh, things like economic development have risen and fallen. Environmental issues rise and fall with uh, the council. Um, you know, in more, more recent years, we've seen some of the, the social issues come to the front, like homelessness and those kinds of things that really weren't issues before. I think early in my tenure, it was really about the nuts and bolts of operating the city. And I think over time, we've, we've gotten more into things like funding Montpelier Alive and you know, more of the whole community-based uh, funding and, and looking at things more as a whole, which I think actually has been healthier for the city. But it definitely changes, and, 
each group brings a, a certain philosophy to it. Even a change of one person can kind of change the, the rhythm and philosophy of the council as a group. So it's, it's interesting to watch. The last 10 years, besides that one person bringing an energy efficiency awareness that you brought to the council, uh, what else has changed in the 10 years? Well, I was going to say some of the things you just said uh, there, Bill. I was thinking about the emphasis on infrastructure as well as social issues and the, and the environment. Uh, those have become uh, more important to the council over the last uh, few years, I suppose. Yeah. And parking remains a constant for 26 years. Absolutely. <laughs> it was talked about in my interview. <laughs> Uh, what are the council's priorities and that shape this budget? So the council has uh, some cate like large categories of goals that have been in place for a few years now. And uh, those big categories are things like uh, community prosperity or um, actually this year, one of the goals is around uh, COVID-19 recovery. It's also about uh, having uh, responsive and responsible government or um, sustainable infrastructure that sort of thing. And those uh, certainly play into our decisions around what we, um, what we put money towards in the budget. Uh, so one of the things is uh, having a, uh, an inclusive uh, community. And that, I think, also speaks to the, the money that we put towards the Social and Economic Justice Committee. They're doing, we, there's uh, $10,000 in the budget for them to do a uh, to work with a consultant on doing a needs assessment for our community. So you know, that's just one example of how uh, those, uh, those uh, big goals have affected uh, our, our budget. And so under those big goals, we do have more specific uh, uh, targets that, we are, that we're trying to uh, hit, that, how, like how that plays out for that year. And those, those change from year to year. And we'll revisit that again after town meeting day this year. Now, Bill, I want to take you back about three minutes when you talked about keeping our tax rate low. Uh, there are three different measures sitting on this ballot, um, of which you're one, major measures, Kellogg Hubbard, the schools, and the city. Roughly what percent every year of our tax burden belongs to the city? About 40, approximately 40 percent, and I, I think that may be including the Kellogg Hubbard. I mean, Keller Cover Library is, you know, 350,000. I mean, that's a, it's a big number, but compared to the, you know, 10 million for the city or 20 million for the schools, it's, it's you know, we tend to fold that into the municipal tax rate. So the, the combined of the, the ballot items in the city's budget is usually 38 to 40 percent of the total tax bill. Uh, let's start off with Kellogg Hubbard because that kind of is out of your control a bit. Uh, their request, did it come in roughly zero or? in terms of an increase? It was the exact same as the last two years. Bill, in terms of the public budget, you issued a 179-page budget summary. So we're not going to go through line by line of 179 because we don't have enough bandwidth to do it. So this might seem a bit disjointed, but it really isn't because we're going to go through a lot of different, as Ann said, we're going to go through a lot of different subdivisions in this. But let's start off on the higher level of this. How much is the city asking for this year? Uh, the city budget is actually down about 2.5% from last year, the overall budget. Um, and that is because we started the, we started the process with about a $1.4 million budget gap due to loss of revenues and some expenses going up and shifts uh, for expenses and a, a very unusual thing that we had a 27th pay period, which only happens once every 12 years. So of course it would be during the pandemic year, uh, which, which- Could you, know, you explain but, what that is? <laughs> so well, most of us who don't think in terms of biweekly budgeting- Sure, so, so a normal 52 <clears throat> week year has 26 pay periods, assuming people get paid every two weeks. Um, but by quirk of the calendar, every 12 years there's a 27th pay period. It just happens to fall within those 12 months. And so that adds about 6% to all your, your personnel costs. And that happened this year. So on top of an already uh, difficult budget gap, that, that was added to our challenge. So as a result, the, the overall budget is lower than it was last year. However, because some of it had to do with lost revenue, the, um, 
the tax request is about 0.6% up from last year, you know, half a percent. Uh, it's really one of the lowest changes we've had in some time, and that was something that was really important too. Now, you've already made adjustments, downward adjustments in the budget before this. Correct. As we went through the pandemic, uh, we had to downward adjust. Uh, our parking revenues were next to nil at, at one point. Our, um, our local options tax, our hotel, uh, our hotels didn't have many people in them. Our bars and restaurants literally didn't have people in them. What did that look like? What was that hit? Oh, well, I think you probably okay. know the numbers better than I do. So. Well, uh, I, I don't know them off the top of my head, but it was very significant. So we've actually had two, uh, you know, when this started almost a year ago in March of 2020, we were still finishing up fiscal year 20. So the first thing we had to do with a third of the year to go, excuse me, a quarter of the year to go, was to make some pretty um, harsh adjustments for the last three months of the year to try to bring the budget in because of parking revenue suddenly just stopping, local options tax stopping, uh, other you know fees for service just dropping out of the bottom. So we had to furlough a fair amount of uh, employees. I think about 20 ultimately ended up being uh, furloughed. Fortunately, uh, the federal subsidy with the extra $600 a week helped make keep them whole. Um, so we didn't have to hurt any of our employees financially, but it saved the city quite a bit of money. Those employees were furloughed right through till the end of July. So uh, not only through the end of the fiscal year, but into, into FY21, which started on July 1st. We then had to make those same adjustments for the fiscal year we're in now, FY21. And so that involved um, keeping positions vacant, um, rolling back capital projects, rolling back uh, equipment, rolling back funding to various agencies. So when we came to do the FY22 budget, we, we really had all, the good news was we'd already kind of thought about it because we'd had to do it for FY21. So we assumed that revenues we're going to stay at the same lower level for FY22. Now, just so we're not talking inside baseball here, we mean FY22 means fiscal year 2022 starts July 1, 2021, and ends June 30, 2022. This, that's the budget we'll be voting on in March. So we started with that rollback budget as our base, not the normal, not the approved budget, with the assumption that it was going to be at least till July 30 of 2022 before we were fully back on our feet. Um, financially uh, as, as the pandemic ends, hopefully. And as I recall, I think the last three months of uh, the FY20 budget when the pandemic started, I, if I recall, I think the estimates were something like um, half a million dollars right. for, those three, Correct. for those three months. So projecting out, it was going to be you know, something like $2 million, which turned out to be not... About one and a half. Yeah, a right, which, is, which was in the right ballpark. Guys, this is inside baseball. <laughs> I want the viewers to know that we recognize that this is inside baseball. We're going to be throwing a lot of numbers out tonight. But at the very end of this show, we're going to talk about the next fiscal year because mm -hmm. we've cut back. We've continued the cutbacks. Is it a dam um, that's waiting with a lot more deferred spending? And we're going to end the show with that discussion because it's a legitimate discussion. Is this the Mount Pelier city government that we really feel we need? Uh, or is this an austerity budget that really pinches more than Ann and the rest of the council would like to pinch? But let's stay in this budget. Bill, what has um, health insurance been like for this year and workers' compensation? Um, so fortunately, this year, our health insurance uh, rate was actually in the single digits of about 5%, which still is high. But in the health insurance world, you know, last year, we were looking at 20, over 20% which really was a budget buster for us. So the fact that it stayed stable this year made a huge difference as we were trying to balance this big gap. Do you anticipate that last year was a blip that won't be repeated? I think health insurance is a world of its own. Uh, so you don't know what's happening in the world of health costs. One of the things that does drive is our experience as, as a, an employee group. We are no longer, uh, for reasons that we don't want to get into unless we want to do a whole show on it. We are, we are a pool of ourselves. We're not in a larger pool like we used to be. So 
an unusual experience or two amongst our employee group or their families can really drive our rates up because of the, the costs. And what had happened the prior year essentially was we spent more money on health care than our premiums had paid for. Uh, and so the, the rates had to catch that up, but this year we were able to manage our costs. And we do, we work really hard on employee wellness and managing costs, but there's nothing you can do if somebody has a catastrophic illness or an accident or those kind of things. And we want our employees and their families to have that coverage so that they can work with peace of mind. What is the new spending in this budget? Approximately 100,000, 200,000? How much is embedded for new program initiatives? Uh, well, I can speak to one of them anyway. Uh, there is, it's $10,000, I believe, that is dedicated towards the uh, capital area neighborhoods. That is a program that was a, an initiative of the city many years ago, but had sort of fallen by the wayside and uh, I, we think has a lot of value for the community. It is a, a mechanism, uh, like getting neighborhoods together, uh, is a, a mechanism for communication between the city and residents, as well as just uh, improving quality of life, particularly during a time of uh, unusual isolation. And uh, I, I think it's it's worth um, worth funding. And feel I feel pretty good about that since it, it was a, a city service not that long ago. Uh, can I go into other city services that that are funded in this budget that people don't really think about much? Sure. Um, the social worker with the place. What's going on with that? That's continued. Um, in fact, I can give you a quick overview to, to answer your initial question and then follow into. With the exception of the capital area neighborhoods that the mayor mentioned, there are no new programming uh, items in the budget. And I would say reductions come across the board. So we're holding six positions vacant right now. Um, we've reduced capital spending. We've reduced equipment spending, operating spending, and funds some funds to our community agencies have stayed the same, but overall funding, others got, had drastic reductions. So overall, our community spending is down, and you know, therefore our external programming is down. Uh, and that reflects, in some cases, use. Um, obviously, rec programs aren't running the way they used to be, or senior programs. Uh, and, um, but certainly, one of the challenges is that we still have service demands. You know, the snow still falls. Um, there's still crime, there's still, you know, police things happen, uh, ambulance, fire calls, those kind of things. Those, those don't really pay attention to the economy or the pandemic. They, they have to be responded to. So how do you maintain a core level of, of safety services and basic services for the community uh, and respond to this crisis? Let's stay in recreation. Does the budget assume we're going to have the pool open this summer? No. Does the budget but, but I will also add that typically the pool uh, is self-supporting. So if we were to open it we, and, and it projected that revenues would support the expenses, we would do that. It wouldn't. Um, is the okay. city projecting that the recreation department will hold summer camp as it did last summer? Yes. Is the uh, city projecting that the senior center will be able to accommodate seniors in that center? We don't know yet. Um, you know, it may depend on the level of vaccination. You know, seniors are one of the most vulnerable population in this pandemic, so opening them up for congregate activities is very challenging. They have had a, quite a bit of success with online classes, um, you know, virtual classes uh, taught by senior center instructors, so that has, has been a good source of continuing activity, but we don't know when we'll be able to open to a full suite of activity. City Hall. When will we have City Hall? We tried it for a while. We had several days a week of City Hall. Do you anticipate during the spring that perhaps we'll have several days of City Hall again? Again, it all depends on external factors. Where we're, the city, and I think wisely, the council and staff made a decision very right at the beginning of this that we were not um, epidemiologists, we were not pandemic experts, and that we would follow the CDC and the state health department, um, that we would, we would accept their guidance and follow it, that we were not in a position to make our own rules and regulations or policies. And so we closely monitor the governor's uh, press conferences twice a week 
and we update our policies based on what we were told. And we had opened up to City Hall two days a week and we're starting to relax based on the case count in Vermont. And then in fall when the case count started going up and we were, the, the state was asked as a whole to ratchet back down, we responded in, in kind to do, you know, with that. So we will reopen all of these activities when we are told by people who know more about this than we do that it's okay to do so. Now you had said that there's six positions that are waiting to be, well, that are still open. Um, Parks picked up a position, didn't they? So a year ago, Parks added two positions. Um, and so part, you know, they were fully funded in this year's <coughs> budget. Um, so yes, so those are still, those are full. So we have six vacant positions that normally we would be filling. Uh, two are in rec, one is in police, one is in finance, uh, and maybe two are in finance. Let me think. Police, yeah, I think maybe two in finance. Uh, and those are held, no, there's one other, oh, DPW, excuse me. So there's one in DPW, one in finance, two in rec, and one in police. Is that six? Uh, I think so. We're out of the weeds now. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, those, are, those are being held until we are on a financial footing to be able to restore them. We specifically call that as being held. We're not cutting those positions out you know, forever and ever. Hopefully, we can restore those positions to levels of service. Um, parks, uh, because we had two retirements in REC, which were both field maintenance people, Parks has agreed uh, for this year to assist in the field maintenance. So we, one of the reasons we didn't need to reduce in parks was that they are going to do double duty and help mow uh, fields and those kinds of things for the, the rec department. Uh, and we may need to find some summer help, but we will not have the same full kind of time staff, but we're also not, we don't believe we're going to be running leagues and all those kinds of things on, on those facilities. So. Now, I have to uh, give the viewer a warning that we're heading back into the weeds again. Uh, the uh, school resource officer and that position, the schools fund half of it, the city funds half of it, but that person was and is on the police department. Is that included, that position, now that they're no longer in the schools? Is that half time that's moving back from the schools back into the cities part of that police um, position that we're down one? Are we down a half a police position instead? No. Do you want to take that no, one? Uh, well, um, uh, why, don't you, why don't you go? Why don't you go? <laughs> we, so uh, maybe I'll just use raw numbers. The police have had 17 uh, sworn police officers, including the chief, captain, everyone who's actually you know, able to serve as a police officer. One of those 17 was the school resource officer. Um, when we did our budget, we weren't sure what the school was going to do, so we did not plan on any revenue from the school. Uh, so when we didn't get any, it wasn't a surprise. So we have now have 16 police officers instead of 17. The person who was functioning as the school resource officer will simply be a patrol person. And we're still, one of the 16. One, we're still holding one position to get back up to 17 eventually. Eventually, when we can financially, correct. Um, there's two different budgets. There's the operating budget and there's the capital budget. What is the capital budget about? Normally, the capital budget totally would be about $2.4 million, but that includes debt payments. That includes what does the capital budget fund? It funds debt payments for capital projects. It funds major projects, uh, typically public works projects, road reconstructions, road paving, sidewalk constructions. Uh, bridges. Bridges, um, retaining walls, those sorts of you know, big, big things. Um, this year, I think, for example, one of the things you said you wanted to talk about, there's funds in there for the reappraisal. Uh, you know, major, major things that aren't operating costs. Um, and then we also have an equipment fund. Um, and so we did take money from there because number one, uh, it was gonna be difficult to manage projects because of contractor restrictions. And number two, 
they're also the kind of things that we can put back in easily as if funds come in it's easy to it's pretty simple to say okay here's another hundred thousand dollars let's add one more project to the list as opposed to hiring a new employee or building a new program or those kinds of things. So in terms of capital projects, are we down in spending from where we were last year or are we holding constant? We are, uh, well, we're down from what we budgeted from last year. In the end of the day, when we actually had to make the re reductions due to the sort of emergency provisions, we're not that much down from where we've actually spent. To your question that you, you posed earlier is, is this sustainable for the future? That's our challenge, is how do we then make up for lost time for you know, two years of, of underfunded capital in a, in a community that really desperately needs capital projects done? Uh, and that's one of the things we're, staff is already working on now for next year's budget, is to have a plan for how do we play catch up. Sustainable streets. Uh, that's something that John Holler talked about, level street funding, and it was a priority, and had watched that on, while on console, yep. uh, trying to put away, what, about $500,000 to keep the streets at a level where we're not playing whack-a-mole? What happened to that this summer, or this coming year? Well, that, that is one of the reduction areas, absolutely. You know, and, and so the question is, how can we, we have a sense of the amount of money that we need, and so the we are looking at ways that we can restore that um, in next year's budget, assuming that we are back to some normal level of, of revenues. Um, and it may be even, I don't know, it might be a short-term bond where we front load some money to do a lot of improvements more quickly uh, to, to catch up for the, the, the lost time. It may just be reallocating you know, funds to those projects in the short run. But, it's absolutely a need. We need to get back on that schedule. It was a smart schedule. And we had, we had reached the level of funding um, that our goal had been set. We were, we were maintaining the streets in the way we wanted to, and we've definitely fallen off in, in right now. And I think, uh, I, oh, well, if ahead. I may, I think one of the important uh, factors in making this budget and knowing that we were making these cuts now uh, for the FY22 budget was to go into it eyes open, knowing that we would need to play catch up uh, in the future and being honest with ourselves about that. And was that the right decision for this moment in time? And we, we felt like it was. And I'm really glad, actually, that we are preparing now to make those uh, make those catch up payments and, and do those projects uh, in the future. Now that also includes major equipment as well. That's right. So we might have put off something like a fire truck or nah, I'm just speaking out of school. Ambulance. Yeah, Pardon? there's a there's a schedule for yeah. all of those purchases. So we've delayed an ambulance purchase, we've delayed police cruiser purchase for two years. So yeah, there are things that are queuing up. Yeah. Let me go through a few programs and, and if you could explain to people um, the housing trust. How much are they in for, and what did they come to council for, and what projects do you anticipate them doing? I believe they asked for forty thousand dollars. Was it forty? Well, the or? housing trust fund had hoped initially to be at one hundred and ten thousand. That's where mm. we had funded them at, in theory, in last year's budget. We ended up dropping them to sixty, I think, in the current year, oh, and okay. then I think yeah. maybe forty for this yeah. budget coming up. I don't have the exact number, but. Uh, yeah, so they understood, and they have some money left over as well, but maybe you could talk about some of the things they do. Um, yeah, so one of the um, great programs that they offer is the First Time Home Buyers Program, so that if, if someone is looking to buy in Montpelier, they can get a, a small grant to help make that happen. They also are, um, they anticipate that there are uh, larger projects that, uh, happen in Montpelier to increase the amount of housing and they're able to give a significant amount of money to those projects when they are, are ready and when they're uh, about to potentially happen and need that funding. So things like the, uh, the French block over Aubuchon's, uh got received money from the Housing Trust Fund. Um, you know, great projects that, that need a, a boost uh, to get over the finish line. Montpelier Development Corporation, are they in the budget? No. They are not in the budget. They were in the past? Yes. 
what did they come for money or was it just there was nothing there for them? Well, so the Montpelier Development Corporation has uh, gone through a little bit of a transition over the last year or so uh, in that they changed sort of the model of uh, how they operate. They, for since their uh, beginning, they had a, an executive director that was their, really their sole employee. And uh, there's been a bit of turnover in that position, and so they've actually moved to a, a new model that is uh, project manager oriented. And they also had some, some funding left over. And so this year, as, especially as um, you know, they're in uh, transition and they had some money left over, they are, are not included in the budget uh, for this year. But they're still operating. As, Correct. Yes, as a board, and, and you know, we anticipate uh, seeing, or I should say, uh, I, I believe that board will, will continue. Yeah. And we're having discussions with them about how to structure this going forward. But, you know, they were very gracious. They understood the circumstances. They understood where they were. And they, they said, you know, hey, if, if you need to hold us at zero for this year to get through the hump, we, we understand that. And, uh, but normally, they had been previously funded for at $100,000 per year. Uh, during last year's budget rescissions, we dropped them to $75,000. Um, you know, in FY20, and then, uh, excuse me, 21, the year we're in now, and then for 22, um, we've got them at zero, and then we will be discussing where we go from there. Now, we're going back in the weeds again, a warning. They were budgeted out of the local options tax, weren't they? Correct. What is the local options tax, and what happened to the local options tax during pandemic? We definitely had a drop. The local options tax, just for those who aren't familiar with it, is a 1% rooms, meals, and alcohol tax. And that's alcohol sold in restaurants or bars, not alcohol that you buy at the grocery store. Um, so obviously, it is a, a tax that is a revenue source that is generated when people are out uh, congregating, going to these places, uh, buying meals. And while there is some of that going on, in, whether it's takeout or small versions, it's certainly not at the level that has occurred. Certainly, rooms are not being used at the rate they were used before. So we've seen about a 30% drop, uh, at least, in, in local options taxes, and we budgeted for a fairly significant drop. Hopefully we'll be wrong and we'll get more, uh, but we tried to be conservative in our approach. Um, so that, obviously, one of the major things that's funded out of that is, is the economic development. So it made sense that since that was a drop in revenue, that, that would be an area that we didn't spend. Montpelier, you're live. Are they in the budget? Yes. They are in the budget, uh, but I believe there's not funding for the July 3rd uh, celebration. Right. So the operations for, the, for Montpelier Alive remain in the budget at the same amount, but some of the extra event funding has been taken out. Is there funding for um, the energy plan or for Confluence Park? So yes, there is funding for the uh, energy plan. So as uh, what is the energy? Yeah, plan? Yeah, fair enough. So the city has a net zero energy goal uh, to reach or achieve net zero energy, or to produce renewably as much as we are consuming uh, uh, by 2030. That's that's the goal. So we've made great progress towards that. Actually, uh, some of the data that we got from the Energy Committee had a uh, reduction in the amount of carbon emissions that the city was producing at about, um, we reduced it by 56% over the course of uh, 10 years or so, which is uh, pretty exciting. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And so in order to plan uh, the, the route, how we're gonna get to net zero by 2030, uh, there's funding in that budget and um, yeah, we're going to be uh, announcing who will be doing that work for us, who, who will be our consultant uh, pretty soon. Confluence Park, is there anything in the budget for changes in Confluence Park? Not specifically. Um, that would be a major capital project. We've, uh, uh, we've got a design, we have some cost estimates, and there's some grant funding being sought right now. Ideally, we would try to do that with as much external funding as possible, uh, but we could use uh, existing city funding if we needed to match. Uh, but right now, there's not a specific fund to just go build it. Let's stay in the neighborhood, the parking garage. What is the status right now of the parking garage? Are we still in court? 
Is it budgeted so that we can stay in court as long as we want or, or need? I, nobody wants to stay in court uh, for as long as we need to stay in court. Where do you see that during this year? And where do you see the issue of the parking garage? Yeah, so it is still in litigation right now, and we are just uh, waiting uh, for some decisions to be made uh, about that. And you know, one once that happens, if we get the green light to go ahead, uh, you know, I think we'll have to we'll we'll assess it based on um, that uh, the the uh, economic and um, pandemic conditions at the time and. Uh, I think we're all hoping that we'll be able to return to uh, normal levels of travel uh, at some point in the future, and, and certainly with the vaccine rolling out, I'm I'm feeling pretty hopeful about that, uh, and so so we'll see. Has the Bashara family said whether they're still in for a hotel? They are. Um, they've been very active. We have regular conversations with them, regular uh, um, discussions about the status of litigation. They remain an active partner, uh, as the mayor said. Um, obviously, once the litigation clears, and we have no idea when that will be, uh, at this point a trial is scheduled for probably late summer, early fall. Uh, there's a, there are going to be some motions coming uh, actually at the end of this month, and then decisions on those which will set the stage for what is left to be litigated. Um, if the appellants choose to, to appeal decisions to the Supreme Court, that could add another year or so to the process. Uh, and I think what what will have to happen is, is, is due diligence at that time. We will look at the market for a hotel. We'll have to look at the finances, how much is it going to cost to build these, uh, and, and all of that. I think it's interesting, uh, you know, this is kind of a, the city right now is in a little bit of a, a um, it's an interesting quandary because the funds, the funds essentially for the litigation and all of this are coming from project costs. And um, if we were to discontinue the project, we would have to, so we have an approved $10 million bond for the project. If we were to discontinue the project, we'd have to issue the bond for the approximately million or a little bit more that we've already spent, which means taxpayers would be paying for that for nothing uh, because there wouldn't be anything built. Uh, and, and on the other hand, when we get to the end of it, um, with so much of the project cost being eaten up in litigation, you know, we may be looking at how to how to fund the, the difference. So it's certainly uh, the it sounds like a lose lose. Well, it, it certainly has created, um, it, and it may be the intent of those that are appealing it is to drive costs up and to delay. I don't know, but uh, it certainly is creating a situation that we have to manage and watch very closely. Well, let me take you out of the city budget. We're going to stay in budgetary stuff. Water rates, how are those handled this year? What do we anticipate for water rates? Yeah, so there's a plan uh, over a very long period of time about uh, how the water and sewer rates will change uh, over time so that we can achieve a sustainable level of uh, quality of infrastructure. And uh, we actually just had a meeting about this not that long ago uh, with the city council. And this, uh, for the, we approved uh, some rates, to, or unless we're having another hearing about them. We, I think we might have another hearing about them. So but the, the council approved the budgets for the water oh, and okay, sewer budget. You. And the rates will be set in June. The anticipation, so the, the plan that the mayor referred to calls for uh, us to try to add a 1% premium on top of whatever inflation is in a given year to help fund the infrastructure. So inflation this year ran about 1.4%. So I think we're probably looking at 2.5% rate changes in water and sewer to, to do that. Um, that's also aided, and I think, you know, just you think simply adding a percent over a long period of time, would that be enough to pay for the, the infrastructure? But there are other things to consider. There's some, some major debt coming off the books in a couple of years. For example, the water treatment plant is about $400,000 a year in debt payments that we pay for it, and that, that will be coming off the books in three years or something. So without having to drastically raise rates, we suddenly can free up $400,000 a year to, to go into infrastructure. So part of it is managing what we know are those kinds of costs. Now our sewer rates, that's the water treatment plant over by Dog River? Yeah, the water resource recovery facility, yeah. Well, you have a, such a nice, a nicer way of putting it than I do. <laughs> is that budgeted so that 
we're already budgeting all of our changes and the like. Or has that already been factored in or will that be a step increase every year as well? That, I believe that's similar. Similar to, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because, because again, this, the wastewater rates, the sewer rates, aren't just on the plant. That is also sewer, old sewer lines. Th those break and leak as well uh, and require management. Some of them need to be in, in, increased in size. So it's, uh, there's the, the district, well, the, for water, it's called the distribution system. For sewer, it's the collection system that, that, that need a lot of underground work. Remember, we have an old city, uh, so some of these lines are, are quite aged. There is some major work going on at the Water Resource Recovery Facility, um, the artist formerly known as the Sewer Treatment Plant. <laughs> and that will be, that's very exciting. That is going to be a, allow us to take uh, food waste, generate more uh, electricity to, to um, you know, to operate the plant, to reduce our costs, uh, bring in more revenues. Uh, and that was a bond that was actually approved the same day as the, as the um, parking garage. The parking garage, yeah, thank sorry. you. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. I was struggling to come up with it. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that is, you know, the savings from that um, is projected to sort of balance out what we would have had to spend if we'd just done normal maintenance and normal upgrades on the plant. Our reappraisal. Uh, now I'm going back in the weeds again for all of you who want to take the volume and shut it down for a little while. <laughs> Bill, could you explain the reappraisal process uh, in terms of you reach a certain level and then the city is asked to reappraise properties. Where are we in that? And, and explain the process. I, I hacked it. I did a hack job. Sure. So the, the basis of a fair and equitable tax system is, is our tax assessment, since property taxes are our major force, source of, of revenue. And so making sure that you know, your house and your house and my house are all equitably appraised. It doesn't mean that they're the same value, but it means that they are meeting today's market value, not 10 years ago. Um, because those things could change, or the relationship between commercial properties and residential properties. Um, so equity is very, very important. The state, because now there is a statewide property tax with, for schools, um, the state has set a standard that when you are what's known as the common level of appraisal, so how, how accurate are your appraisals? If they dip below 85%, then you're required to do a reappraisal. And we've just hit... 84 point something. That's not good. <laughs> so, so we will be, we haven't gotten our notice yet, but we've known it was coming. So we actually already have contracted with a firm to begin work in 2023. The, the FY22 budget has half of the money in it, um, and the FY23 budget will have the, the second half. Approximately how much is it? To do About and what they do is they, they will visit or try to visit uh, every property in the city to uh, not only appraise its, you know, they will do statistical analysis of sales uh, and to look at condition improvements since the last time they looked at your home so that not, they're not only comparing, you know, are these both three bedroom homes with two bathrooms in the same neighborhood, but one is in really great shape and one is in really poor shape. You know, what they, they try to do an estimate of what the then current market value is. What people don't understand is that we have to, we have to tax people on their most recent reval amount, revaluation amount. So the last one we had done was about nine years ago, 2011, I believe it was. So we're all still being taxed on those values. And as many of us know, you know, properties have sold in Montpelier at, at very high prices and very quickly. But a, a home could be valued at 200000 and just recently sold at 350000 We don't just change that value to that new sale amount. We are still at the $200,000 value. So that's where these inequities start stretching. As some homes appreciate faster than others or some buildings, um, suddenly what was fair. So what you're saying is that your neighbor in approximately the same home is paying taxes on 350000 and you're paying on 225000 No, what I'm saying is that... Well, I knew I'd mess this up somehow. <laughs> yeah, no, what I'm saying is, let's say both of you were at 200000 So you're both paying taxes on a $200,000 value. Your neighbor sells their house for $350,000 and made a bunch of improvements to it. Right. You're still both paying on the $200,000. So what we need to do is to see, first of all, is to reflect their sale and their improvement and then see 
what is the best analysis of what your home might be worth. It might be 280 now. Theirs might be 380. So instead of keeping you both at 200, it's adjusting them both to what now is currently fair. Um, so what I think a popular concern with reappraisals is as people see maybe their home might double. It doesn't mean their taxes are going to double because everything's going up. So our tax rate is based on the total valuation. We don't, we don't get more money from a reappraisal. I think that's a common misconception that the city's raising the grand list and can suddenly get a whole bunch more money. We still only, we still only raise what the budget, the approved budget is. It just redistributes how it's paid in a more equitable manner. There are more houses sold in Montpelier than there are commercial properties. Yes. I think that's a certainty. Yes. Is commercial downtown and commercial Montpelier also going to be appraised at the same time? Everything will be. All property will be. How do you establish a fair market value when you don't have properties selling that are approximately the same in downtown? Uh, so you do look at whatever sales exist. You also look at real estate sales in, say, Washington County to get a sense of what commercial sales might be. Um, and then we do a survey of uh, rental income. Um, you know, so if, if you know, a, a business has a, you know, is a tenant in the building, commercial, unlike a home, a home is sort of someone just says, I'll pay this much because I want to live in this home. It's got nice features. It's got what I want. Commercial buildings tend to sell or be valued based on how much they can generate. How much rent can I collect? How much you know, will the storefront get? How much will the apartments upstairs get for me? And so we have to develop schedules that say, okay, you know, a square foot of downtown rent is going for this on average, not necessarily specific for each building, but it might be, okay, $16 per square foot, I'm making that up, is the Main Street rate, and $17 a square foot is the State Street rate. And apply that to those buildings and then that figures out what their market value might be based on their their earning potential. So if I can summarize this in two points. One, we shouldn't be fearful of the reappraisal. That it isn't going to mean dramatically high, higher taxes. Not necessarily. However, uh, it is fair to say in any reappraisal, anytime you redistribute things are based on equity, some people whose properties have, have appreciated more than others um, are going to see a, a higher than normal tax increase, and those whose properties have not appreciated as much as others will actually see a tax reduction. Last time, I think the, the average was about a 30% adjustment, so for homes that were around 30%, their taxes didn't change, and then people above or below that mark. Um, I, I will say, uh, not to alarm people, but I just think it's a, it's a reality. The last three reappraisals we have done have seen a much greater appreciation in residential properties versus commercial properties. So every time we've done it, the tax burden has shifted slightly to the residential sector. And as you mentioned, there haven't been a lot of sales, particularly with the current economic conditions. Um, you know, it's, it, I suspect that might happen again, but I, I don't know. And? I don't think of anything further to add. Will there be houses in savings pasture by 23 that will be factored into this? Well, I think it's probably fair to say that we are uh, uh, looking at all the things that the city can do to help enable that. Uh, so, for, you know, just for example, uh, at one of our most recent council meetings, we were talking about. Uh, some of the, the zoning needs that might need to uh, be adjusted in order to uh, realistically accommodate housing in, in Sabin's Pasture. And so I think, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly hopeful. We're not holding our breath, but uh, trying to do what needs to be done to plan uh, for that to happen. So just to follow on that, the city has been working actively with the property owner, owners, and um, those zoning changes, which will actually be on the council agenda next week for a formal hearing to be adopted, uh, were at their request, feeling that it would make, make it easier. We believe there's intent to move forward with the project. At the end of the day, and, and we are working with them about possible uh, infrastructure funding using the tax uh, increment financing uh, district. What is tax incremental financing? Okay. So it's called, people refer to it as TIF. It is a program where um, it, 
anticipated new revenues from a development can go and pay for related infrastructure, related public improvements. So maybe an expanded sewer line or a new sidewalk or those kinds of things. I think the, the best example we have in Montpelier is the parking garage where the, the anticipated tax revenues from the new hotel, which no, don't exist right now, would then be used to help pay for the garage, which is pu a public benefit, but also necessary for the private business to, um, to happen. So in Sabins, it could be some water and sewer infrastructure, it could be sidewalks, it could be maybe a, a roadway into the property if it were to become a public road. So we, we're still working on those kinds of things that would be of public benefit, but also private benefit. Uh, and, and that would allow them to build their homes. Since we consider new residential properties a public benefit, and they would be adding new, new taxes to the grand list. We've already been doing sewer work along Berry Street in there, that area, haven't we? We, did, we had to do a project last summer kind of quickly because of the rail line relocation, and um, they were on top of some sewer lines there. So we did have to do some work, but there's more to do. It's an old line and it's undersized, so to hand, it would need, more needs to be done. And if I'm correct, Gin Lane, that's next to a distillery, could in theory go all the way up that hill. Uh, it could. Uh, the, the Gin Lane was located in a way that to be directly across from what will be the entrance to any Sabin's pasture so that it will be a four-way intersection all lined up. Um, so that was planned, and that is where the entrance to any Sabin's Pasture projects will go. Um, so, yeah, ideally that would be, I don't know that it would be called Gin Lane on the other side of the road. It's also where the railroad crosses the right. street, which, again, was intentionally uh, designed. Right. What about the state property uh, next to um, the bever where the beverage store used to be between Shaw's and the art store? Um, are we purchasing that? Is that already budgeted for? Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, as a council, decided that that was a priority a property for us to own. We wanted to make sure that we would have control of uh, what happened there, and so that, that did mean finding some um, money or um, basically coming to an arrangement uh, with the state so that we will uh, own that property. So that leaves open the possibility of. It, uh, whether it could be a, a park space or a building. Uh, so that's yet to be told, and we, um, have, we've had a little bit of discussion around that, but not very much, and so we'll probably... If the state said yes, would it be in the budget? The state has said yes. The state gave us terms for purchasing it, so um, it would be spread out over two years. Uh, in the current fiscal year, um, so we've got to just reallocate funds out of our current budget, and then we budgeted the second half. In, in the FY22 So So that, pr that purchase is budgeted Correct. already? Correct, yes. It's not contingent? No. Right. Um, and then the elephant in the room, the recreation center. That's a very, very large, ambitious project. Where does that stand right now? Yeah, so that is also on hold at the moment, and uh, we were able to make great progress on it so that we were just about ready to go uh, to the to the voters to the public uh, for a bond, uh, but uh, but then the the pandemic hit, and so uh, I I anticipate that that is one of the things that we will revisit when it seems apparent that our economy has uh, has really returned. Obviously, we're not there yet, so it's hard to anticipate when that will be on um, on our radar again. I promised I would end with the next year budget. Not this one, but the following year. We have six positions that are on hold right now. We've got uh, a truck, an ambulance. We've got all of this that's been sitting there, backed up. Uh, does that budget look really awful in terms of sustainability? I know it's impossible for you to say, given well, a, a steady growth curve. So you know, if... If our revenues return to the level, so this has all been predicated on, um, you know, a loss of over half a million dollars in parking revenue, and a, a loss of a hundred or so thousand in or more in local options taxes. Uh, we've anticipated, um, and we don't know for sure, a loss in payment in lieu of taxes from the state. The reason for that is not that the state is not a, a fair player, but the state's payment in lieu of taxes uh, fund 
comes from local options taxes around the state, local sales taxes. So our assumption is if those taxes are down statewide, the state will not have the revenues to, to make those payment low of taxes. And there are a few other assumptions that we've made. If our revenues come back to normal, our budget will come back to normal. And we would be allocating funds back into those capital projects, back into equipment, back into the services. And obviously, we also have an opportunity to, to look at how we might reprogram any of those funds since we would be, be uh, coming in. So there's a huge contingency there, but if, if things go back to normal, then our budget shouldn't be any more difficult than it is. In any Except given. for we have backed up need. Right, and so that's a, that's a challenge in and of itself for the capital, for the equipment and the capital. So we need to figure that out. But just in general, it shouldn't be more challenging than a, than a typical year. I think what my concern is, and I don't know if we've really talked about this as a public, is you know it comes back close but not quite, right? Like we get 80% hmm. of it back, uh, then what? And I think that's when, you know, that's when then we could be in for a real challenge. I imagine that the state is cutting you people in to the could-be's of COVID funding for state and local governments. You know, as to what that could mean, the local government section of that, as well as cutting you into the potential talk of infrastructure funds. That's another major project that, that Congress is discussing. Is that happening, those kinds of dis discussions? Not um, to the level of specificity that I think you were um, in, uh, assuming. Because the state doesn't know, you know, it's still things are you know things are being discussed at the federal level. We occasionally get something from our congressional delegation saying, "Here's what this proposal might look like," but the state doesn't know what they're going to get, how they're going to get it, what funding it's going to be, and, and who it's allocated for. Uh, does it go to the community development fund and then be granted back out? Um, how much is it would the state keep for its own needs? I mean, they're hurting too; their revenues are down. Uh, so I think there's a lot there. Uh, I know the city and the League of Cities and Towns are certainly advocating for funding to come to local governments. Uh, national groups like the National League of Cities, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the International City Managers Association are heavily lo uh, lobbying Congress for direct appropriations to towns and cities because, you know, we're really bearing the brunt of direct services. Now, if you have these projects all lined up, then you have all of the planning of these projects all lined up, in which case when funds come in, it should be fairly easy to sit and be able to put the bids out and get these things done, yes? That's correct, and we do have that list. We haven't shared it with council yet. That's coming right up uh, soon. One of the next couple of meetings we're gonna share with the council our, our list of the, you know staff's proposals of what the priorities might be, and then the council will move those around however they see fit. So right, the idea is you, hopefully we can you know, plug and play if money comes. The show that you're watching right now is a triangulation. We are a triangle, I am here, Anna's here, Bill is there. Is that a relief not being in a Zoom? It certainly is uh, unusual. Gosh, I mean, I spent all day today on Zoom meetings. Was, today was our remote day with, the, with students and um, you know, normally I'm in a classroom with uh, 12 other uh, humans and, and we're all masked and six feet apart, but, uh, it's, but it's certainly nice to, to be able to actually, uh, you know, be, be a distance from each other, but be able to see your faces. <laughs> As I'm a distance, that's a good segue. As I'm a distance from you, but I'm going to be voting on town meeting day. And actually, I'm going to be voting with my wife on town meeting day, as we always do. And I would encourage you not only to vote, but to vote intelligently, which basically means you've watched this show. Watch the show that Anne did from Montpelier from her perspective, which was a very good show. And watch the candidates as well as the school board candidates. Jim Murphy with his um, show on the school budget, as well as our candidate for the Parks Commission for a five-year seat. All of them are great candidates. They're all very, very good shows. And get out and vote and encourage your friends to vote. That's really important. And you could do it absentee. It's not that hard to do. It doesn't take that much out of your life. But do it for the sense of civic spirit for our town. Thank you very much.